Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to be here today and to discuss a topic that's uh, close to my heart and I think of great interest to policy analysts in Japan and around the world. I want to start off with a remark which I think is concerning uh, many economies, not just the Japanese economy, but um, the question about income inequality and inequality more generally. Um, we know that uh, inequality is on the rise as measured in many different ways around the world. And in fact, in, in, in Japan and in Europe and in the United States, there's a great deal of concern about the trends in inequality. And I put up a graph uh, that comes from, uh, derived from some OECD statistics, but from our own independent analysis of a graduate student at Chicago, um, looking at um, what the Gini coefficient path has been in Japan before and after taxes and transfers. And even after redistribution, we see a slight upward trend. So that the Gini coefficient, which starts at midpoint around 9, point 19, and about 1985, about 0.3, rises uh, towards the end of the period uh, and uh, in, in 2010. And there are many other ways to uh, measure this uh, change in inequality. For example, we can look at wealth inequality, we can look at inequality in, uh, in terms of poverty rates. And here I would just make a point that when we look at the uh, structure of poverty, uh, where it's particularly striking is among the category of single parents, and that's gonna play a particular significance. Uh, it's not so much as a, gra a gross trend, but there is a high level, and we see a slight upward trend. So if you were to compare Japan to many other countries around the world, it's much less of an issue. And if you look at the percent distribution of the number of Japanese households in various self-assessed conditions, what you can see, and again, this will play some important role in what I have to say, is that mother-child households in particular, the category at the very bottom of those figures, are the ones that showing particular stress. And um, has been pointed out by one of the commentators, Kaz uh, Yamaguchi, who will be talking later, uh, if we look at gender inequality in Japan, there's some sharp differences, and we look, for example, at the uh, payments between the hourly wage of men and women, and we can see the difference that really rises comes in part-time and full-time sectors. So in many ways to cut the uh, figure, you can actually see that there are important inequalities that are rising in Japan. But what has actually been discussed and is now really remarked is not just inequality per se, but how inequality relates to social mobility. And in the literature around the world, this empirical relationship that you see here, which I'll try to point to, I'm not sure the pointer is that effective, but this gives a relationship between what's called the intergenerational or income elasticity, or the intergenerational elasticity, sometimes called the IGE, and uh, which is basically the relationship of the income of the children in terms of the income of the parent, we can see and that's the coefficient beta. And I plot the coefficient beta here. And what we can also plot down here is the Gini coefficient uh, after taxes and transfers, which is a good measure of, the, uh, of, of inequality, which is a measure of inequality. And you can see that Japan, this is the measure of inequality, has a measure of cross-section inequality that's somewhat higher than many other countries like Canada, Denmark, and in other, uh, especially Scandinavian countries, Finland, Norway, uh, and has a relatively high, but not atypical, uh, in terms of this regression line, a relationship between income inequality and uh, the intergenerational elasticity. And many people have remarked about this relationship. So the number of this IGE is 0.15 for Denmark, which is a modern welfare state. It's about 0.47 for the US and the UK, and for Japan, this IGE is around 0.3 or 0.4. But recent studies, some done by the scholars in this institution, show there's no particular trend. So the question is that there's a link between income inequality and intergenerational mobility. And there's an economic theory that justifies that, and that is the notion that people who come from less advantaged families, and family income plays a major role, suffer difficulties in financing education and financing a number of opportunities, including financing uh, the schooling uh, and their opportunities to succeed. 
in a, a lot of other investment activities. So this is a, uh, a serious uh, concern in, in many quarters around the world. The question, though, is what do we make of this relationship? What do we make of a relationship between changed income inequality and this intergenerational elasticity? There are some economic theories, I've given you one, which is saying that inequality in resources or access to resources could lead to intergenerational immobility. So it's not just that we're unequal in this generation, but we'll be unequal in the next generation as we transfer, as, as the next generation passes its way on and, and, and provides resources for the, for, the, for, 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 the, for, the, for the future generation to either go to school or not go to school. That's one model. But you can turn this relationship around, and it has been turned around by my uh, colleague uh, Gary Becker and his students. The idea being that beta, this intergenerational elasticity, this coefficient on current income, could be the reason why there's such inequality in, uh, the, in the cross section. And the idea is, well, if there is a lot of gener intergenerational dependence, uh, and that people who are born to the well-to-do and have the advantage of birth, if those people were to pass that on, then there may be greater inequality in the larger society. So there's a relationship that's not fully uh, really fully accorded. Now, many people would argue, well, we can look at this relationship and conclude, include strongly, that re income redistribution will play a major role in promoting income and in promoting social mobility. But I think that's a far from clear conclusion. So what is the traditional approach that's based on that reading of the data? So the traditional approach, which is based on that reading, is what is sometimes called alms to the poor, or redistribution. So the traditional Western welfare state is based on this idea. And what I want to consider today is what are the effective policies to foster social inclusion, to reduce economic and social inequality, and to promote social and uh, economic opportunity. There's a lot of literature around the world, and economists, very famous economists like Ramsey, uh, very famous economist of the 1920s in England, James Murley's, and a lot of recent work on income redistribution has essentially talked about efficient ways to combat inequality and to have efficient transfer systems that keep incentives for individuals, that tax people, but at the same time make sure that the pie, the total social pie, increases. And one of the big themes that comes from this literature is so-called trade-off between inequality and uh, efficiency. That if we, if we reduce inequality through transfers, we reduce economic efficiency by taxing individuals and distorting incentives. So it's a very static view, this view. And it's a view that only looks about the effect of taxation and redistribution on labor supply and labor supply responses. Today, I want to present a complementary approach that actually, in my view, is more effective strategy for reducing long-run poverty and for promoting social mobility. And it's a strategy of human development. And it takes us into a stat situation where we think much more broadly about the way we can actually address these questions of inequality and opportunity. So what I want to make is a point that I think is a truism. It's kind of obvious. We know that and look at studies of inequality, whether here in Japan or in Western Europe or in the United States, that skills are major determinants of inequality. That those who have skills generally do better. Those who are more educated, those who have more on-the-job training, who have skills in various dimensions, those people actually do relatively better. And what I want to do is to think of a strategy that's based on, when, and here's the title of the lecture, creating capabilities, capabilities or capacities or skills. I'm going to use those as synonyms today. Synonyms that essentially put together that say that if we can enable people and create capabilities, then we can actually allow people and we can to, to flourish, and we can actually think about ways to promote uh, reduction of inequality and at the same time promote economic efficiency. So what I want to argue is that if we think along these dimensions, we'll recognize that a complementary strategy to the typical alms to the poor or redistribution is a strategy that thinks strongly about how you might uh, create capabilities, empower people. So what are capabilities? What do I mean by that? I mean the capacities to act and to create future capacities. So it's the ability to act and be a functioning agent in society, not just in the economy, but in society at large. So here I'm taking a term uh, that's used in the literature by Amartya Sen, 
and, um, and his co-worker, Martha Nussbaum, my colleague at the University of Chicago. So in their work, they define these concepts of capabilities as real freedoms that people have to achieve and, to, and the beings and doings that they value and they have reason to value. So we can think about capacities or capabilities in a general sense. It's the ability to choose to be what you want to be. It's not shaping people in any particular direction, but what it's doing is shaping their possibilities and allowing them to choose. So it gives them maximum flexibility. So in economics, there's a lot of work about trying to think about people who can have maximum flexibility in responding to the challenges of life. Those are the kind of capabilities I mean. And people within this larger capability set can decide whether or not they want to be one kind of person or another, but they have the freedom to make that choice as opposed to somebody who has a very limited set of skills, a very limited set of capabilities, and has a very restricted choice set. So let me talk about eight broad lessons from the recent literature on capabilities and skill formation. And I wanna talk a little bit about these themes. The first thing that's very important, and I think it's especially important in Japan, is to reflect on the fact, which is an obvious point in some ways, that multiple skills vitally affect performance in life across a variety of dimensions. There's a large body of evidence that shows that cognitive and non-cognitive skills, and by non-cognitive skills, I mean preferences, I mean the ability to control oneself, conscientiousness, staying on task, socializing, engaging in a broad range of social and economic transactions, that these affect a whole range of behaviors. It's low dimensional set of skills, so it's not just a tautology. And we can see how these affect things like how you marry, divorce, the effect of receiving welfare, the earnings you make, the health, and a variety of other dimensions of performance in life. But it's the multiplicity of skills that matter, and I think that's something that gets overlooked. And so it's not just the PISA scores. It's not just the function of what is the like, IQ or the achievement test score or grades. It's a much more inclusive notion of skills. The second thing I would put out, which recent research has found, panel data research, research from a lot of studies by child development experts, by economists, by neuroscientists, by sociologists, that gaps in skills between individuals and across socioeconomic groups open up at very early ages for both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And what we also can find, and we find very interesting, very, I have a colleague at the University of Chicago, Steve Roudenbush, whose inaugural lecture at Chicago about eight or nine years ago, I found staggeringly parallel to, and presenting graphs to my own research that actually had done this and shown exactly the same kind of phenomena. That these skills open before children, open up the gaps in skills before children even go to school. And that during the school years, Schooling, although it can contribute somewhat to inequality, widening inequality in these measures of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, that basically schooling itself does not have that much of an effect in reducing and eliminating. Whatever is going on in the early years matters the most. Now, a third point is that the skill gaps, the emergence of skill gaps can be interpreted as a manifestation of genetics. So smart parents could earn more, they could achieve more because they're smarter. They're smart, their kids are smart, and all they're doing is passing on their genes. But a large body of empirical work, experimental work, and also non-experimental work shows the powerful role of parenting and environments, including mentors and teachers in shaping skills. So 100 years ago, when the eugenics movement was in full sway, genes were considered to be fundamentally important and that the role of heritability was exaggerated to an extreme. Now we have a much more considered view of how genes matter. Genes matter. Heritability is important. But there's mounting evidence that gene expression is modified by environments and that actually heritability plays a role, but environments also play a very important role, and especially early environments. And what we've learned from understanding about the technology of skill formation or capability formation is that there's compelling evidence of critical and sensitive periods in the development of children. Different capacities are malleable at different stages of the life cycle. So we've come to understand that by about the age 10, before, really be, before uh, the teenage years and around the period of um, 
transition into the teenage years, what you find is, into adolescent period, that you find that IQ is fairly malleable until those periods becomes what, what economists and statisticians would call rank stable. So you can essentially change the knowledge you know after age 10, or after age 13 or so, but what happens is that you find yourself that, the, that there's a fairly high rank stability. Those who are very smart when they're 10 will typically be very smart at age 30. And we also see that there's persistence of early life disadvantage in shaping these, this intelligence and in shaping really other important outcomes. So these early life conditions are important, but different skills have different malleabilities at different stages. So into the later stages of the life cycle, there is, because of the work that we've seen in neuroscience on the slowly developing prefrontal cortex, the children uh, can still have a lot of malleability in their non-cognitive skills, even into their young adult years. And this suggests then a strategy in which we can think, well, if we want to make interventions and target interventions for people in the adolescent years, we might exploit rather thoroughly the notion that there is a fundamental uh, ma greater malleability in non-cognitive skills to later stages in the life cycle, and less so for cognitive skills. So I think that's an important lesson that we need to understand. A fifth point is that if we look at the gaps in skills across socioeconomic groups, and when we measure those skills, and this is by measuring the skills by measurements of what goes on inside the family, and this is something that modern research looking at panel data and looking at very detailed surveys has been able to do, we find substantial differences in children and the environments that children face. And so what we see is children that are growing up in environments where professional parents are uh, speaking to them really see almost twice as many words. They can speak almost twice as many words at age three than children from disadvantaged working class families. And, uh, and they, 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 there is essentially a substantial benefit, and we can see a correlation anyway between family environments, and we can also see some sharp differences in family parenting styles, and that has a huge role to play, and we'll see how that is. So I don't want to be left with a position, which I think some people have taken from this literature, that somehow uh, all is over by age three or by age five. There are various magic ages that appear in this literature. So I don't want to say it's all over at any age in the life cycle. What I want to say is that although early life conditions are important, there's considerable evidence of resilience in life cycle recovery over the life cycle. Initial disadvantage has a lingering effect, but we can at least partially compensate. And the most effective adolescent interventions for children who grew up with neglected childhoods can actually be those that create the formation of personality, social and emotional and character skills through mentoring and guidance and also providing information. A lot of work, experimental work and non-experimental work has shown this. And this evidence consistent again with this notion of greater malleability of personality and character skills into adolescence and young adulthood. And so what we've actually found that even though later life remediation efforts have not been as effective as early life measures, nonetheless they can be, as a rule, more effective interventions in the early years there are some effective interventions in the later years. Workplace-based adolescent intervention programs and uh, apprenticeship programs of mentoring can actually show some very promising results. And when we start looking at these different programs, it's not a question of comparing one treatment effect with the other. When we get into the mechanism of what's going on, we see a great similarity between what goes on in a successful workplace environment a successful job training program, a successful apprenticeship program, and what goes on in a successful family. Namely, mentoring, family interaction, the ability of the parent or the child, the mentor and the child to interact in a constructive way, engage each other, and produce an effective set of capacities. So there's a, there's a commonality where mentoring, surrogate parenting, parenting, all operate in the same pattern towards promoting, stimulating, and what economists and what child development psychologists would call uh, scaffolding, staying with the child, working with the child or the adolescent, and staying with it, challenging the child to the next step, but not challenging it too much so the child can still benefit.
So it suggests that we, there are some commonalities, but it has to do with social interactions. It's not just a question of the teacher standing in front of a classroom and sort of speaking to the students in an objective way. It's really the engagement that plays a huge role. And this is the point seven, that a recurrent finding is the crucial role of parent-child, mentor-child relationships that do this scaffolding. And this leads us to a much richer notion of what it means to create skills. Sometimes economists can think in very abstract terms and say, well, we can think of going into a child's life and investing in the child. But when we study that investment process, what we understand is that that process of interaction, which we sometimes call investment or sometimes call teaching, involves taking the child, tracking the child, encouraging the child to the next steps forward in what is sometimes called the proximal zone of development. So you take the child to the next step and you recognize that the child and the teacher in this relationship are both playing roles like an emergent system in systems dynamics theory. And so what we have learned though, and this is I think an important role, and this is something I wanna stress, is that even though there are many interventions for adolescents that have been mistargeted, there are some promising ones, but there is a very, very compelling evidence that high quality interventions targeted to the early years are effective in promoting skills. And this is a manifestation of what economists call dynamic complementarity, and I'll explain that concept. But what it really means is that if we build the skill base today, what we do is we create an even greater skill base for tomorrow. And then a persistent finding, especially for children in the adolescent years, is those people who have more ability, more motivation, are the ones who often make the best investments in schooling. But they're also the possibility, instead of thinking of that as a deterministic situation that those abilities are given by genes, what we've come to understand is those abilities, those capabilities, are actually created through early investments, through investments throughout the life cycle. And that a very powerful role is the role that's played by investments in the early years in building the skill base to make later year investments very successful. So what I want to talk about then is a strategy in which I want to think, instead of alms to the poor, to think about pre-distribution, not just redistribution. I think that's a very important uh, finding. So I want to try to do is promote a comprehensive understanding of this process of capability formation. And we need to think about the policies that recognize what skills matter and how they're most effectively produced and which skills we should target at which stage is the life cycle. So it's a much more nuanced view. And I think it avoids a view that many governments around the world have. It avoids a fragmented and often ineffective approach to public policy that miss the pervasive importance of skills and how skills are created. So what I want to argue is that many fragmented solutions are not effective. So we typically think, uh, when we look at fragmented solutions, and I'll give you some examples, the obvious solution for a fragmented solution is you have more crime, you have more police. If you want to build better schools, uh, you want to build, promote skills or promote achievement test scores, you want to build more schools or hire more teachers. For health, you hire more doctors. And to reduce obesity, you, have, you promote uh, uh, promotional campaigns and teenage pregnancy, teenage pregnancy reduction campaigns. All of those, I'm not saying any of those strategies might not be effective, but they also miss, I think, an important point. They miss an important point that if we have a strategy that avoids just these fragmented solutions and looks at a unified approach where capabilities that produce a variety of outcomes that produce all of these outcomes to varying degrees are a strategy that promotes these capabilities is a strategy that prevents problems and does not just remediate those problems. And in many cases, but not all, prevention can be far more effective than treatment after the occurrence of a problem. Now, of course, there's a, there's a strategic problem here, and that is, well, is it easier I mean, in, in English, we have the phrase that a squeaky wheel gets the grease. I don't know what the statement is in Japanese, but uh, something like that, I think. is. Uh, and there's reason for it. If we know there's a problem, we know we should start addressing that problem. And so there's some arguments as to wait until you know there's a problem. But on the other hand, you also want to do is understand that if you can prevent 
and target effectively the interventions, uh, you can essentially reduce considerably. So it really depends on how effective it is versus to, to target in advance versus how effective it is to treat the problem after it occurs. And I want to argue that at least in the case of skill development, that it's frequently, not inevitably, but frequently the case, and in the cases that I want to talk about today, much more effective to promote skills early on to create the skill base and to prevent, not just to remediate after the problem occurs. So what is an effective, what are the effective ingredients? The effective ingredients are to understanding the powerful role of family life, to understand these multiple capabilities, and to understand this dynamics of capability formation. So let me just lay out a very brief summary of the modern understanding of human development. Now what we've come to understand, and I think this is something that still requires a lot of knowledge on the part, uh, it's a lot of dissemination of knowledge, and so it's something where I hope uh, the Japanese government and I hope that other agencies around the world will take this to heart. Because what we found is that these low levels of these capabilities or skills explain a lot of major social problems, like crime, teenage pregnancy, low wages, poor health. But what happens here in Japan, and I know it's true, I read the OECD reports, I've read the studies that have been done by the Japanese uh, government, is like many countries, Japan focuses on PISA scores and sees that test scores are playing a, are, are a focal point. And there's some concern that Shanghai is overtaking Japan and that somehow, you know, uh, the PISA scores are there. Well, one thing I would point out is that, you know, in many OECD countries, not just Japan, compete on PISA scores. Administrators are hired and fired in countries, the education ministries, and whether or not they successfully raise or lower the uh, 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 PISA scores. But what we've come to understand is, again, that recent studies in the economics of skills show that cognitive skills are only part of the story. These personality skills, which are sometimes called soft skills, uh, physical and mental health, are also very important and they're, awfully, and they're often very neglected. And so these gaps in the skills open up and what, what the OECD does, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a pre-announcement, the OECD is about to issue a report uh, the same OECD that talks about PISA and has a whole section talking about PISA scores, saying that PISA is not enough, that we need much more comprehensive inventories of schools, individuals, and nations, and that we should think about cognitive and non-cognitive skills and how we measure those. Uh, there is a, that report should be coming out in the next month or so. It may be out even this month. So what are the strategies that might be useful? We understand that family lives are major producers of cognitive and social and emotional skills. So we know, and this is very important, because around the world, not just in Japan, and, it's, and Japan is less, it's less true in Japan than other countries like the United States, that supplementing the family and its resources, engaging the family in enriching the life of the child and supporting children in school it, is, can be a very effective strategy. And through this kind of strategies, through these multiple channels, what we find is that we can actually promote by supplementing the family, not replacing the family, but supplementing the family, we can promote skills and we can promote uh, policies uh, that actually create uh, and avoid a fragmented solution and provide a, a strategy that's global in creating effective uh, strategy for promoting uh, across uh, a variety of skills. So it's, instead of thinking of one cabinet agency for each problem, thinking of one problem of can one cabinet agency for promoting capabilities and the skills that will have manifest effects across many aspects of life that are frequently viewed in a very balkanized way, viewed in a very uh, siloed way. So what do we know about these? We know that these interventions have high benefit cost ratios and rates of return. They pass high efficiency criteria. And Unlike the policies that are put forward about tax and redistribution, they have the policy that they are feature that they are face no equity uh, efficiency trade-off. And what's fair and frequently is economically efficient. And these skill bases then essentially create greater economic productivity, reduce inequality, and promote social mobility. So again, I want to argue that the universal ingredient of all these successful interventions is what I would call scaffolding. It's this interaction that takes place in the classroom, in the family, 
at the workplace. That's the universal feature, which is not frequently discussed in those terms, but I think is an essential ingredient of devising an important thing. Well, let me show you a little bit of evidence. I've been talking very abstractly. Let me try to give you a little bit of evidence and talk about what economists, and some economists here at this research institution have worked on very recently. Namely, uh, that psychologists for now for many years, 20 years at least, have developed inventories of how you can measure personality traits. And so they've come up with this set of traits called the Big Five Traits. And the acronym for these traits, at least the English acronym, is OCEAN. So o openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So, uh, and they have various facets, and you can take your look at this. Now, these, these facets are basically derived from Western uh, uh, studies, and there's some suggestion there might be some additional uh, traits that are valued heavily in, uh, in, uh, in societies in the Far East. And particular studies that have been done in China uh, suggest that maybe there may be some additional dimensions having to do more with sociability and uh, group identity. But I think uh, these factors, these, these traits play a very powerful role. And they have been measured, and there are stable ways to, to measure these things. And what do we know about these traits? Let me just show you something. So for example, if we look at the prediction of who goes to jail, OK, and we go from the bottom of the distribution of people in terms of the distribution of uh, uh, cognitive or non-cognitive traits to the top of the distribution, what we see is that People at the very top of the distribution, who are at the very highest quantiles of the distribution, the top, top people in terms of both cognitive and non-cognitive ability, very unlikely to go to jail. So there's very little evidence of a strong effect of that. But what you do see is a very strong, uh, and, and, but if you go down at the bottom of the distribution, the both cognitive and especially, in this case, non-cognitive skills play a very big role in shaping these abilities. Teenage uh, probability of being single with a child, that's also uh, very uh, strongly uh, uh, significant, okay? And uh, we can essentially see very powerful roles. And if we look, for example, at which of these traits is most important for explaining mortality, for example, is it IQ? Is it conscientiousness? It turns out that the trait that's most predictive of a longer life is conscientiousness, not IQ, not any of the other, uh, other five big traits, that, these, that there are these personality traits that play a very powerful role. So let me uh, give you an example of the power of these personality traits. And something, some work that I've done, I just published a book on this subject, uh, is on the so-called GED. The GED is an exam that's given by the United States to about 15% of all students graduating or getting certificates for a secondary school in the United States each year. High school dropouts who take this exam are certified as high school, as, as high school equivalents. And the test has been done carefully by educational statisticians, the psychometricians. And if you plot the distribution of uh, secondary school graduates and GEDs and look at the distribution of cognitive ability, what you see is, is what you, a good psychometrician would expect to see. Very tight relationship between cognitive skills here and uh, among the high school graduates and the GED. So GEDs, high school graduates, have about the same cognitive skills. Uh, high school dropouts who don't take the GED have lower cognitive skills. So that's kind of what people thought they were finding and what the test certified. Yet what do we find? We find that the GEDs, who are just as smart as the high school graduates, are earning at the rate closer to that of high school dropouts. So actually, if we look at various ages and we look at people over the life cycle, we find that the GEDs are actually earning much less than the high school graduates. Uh, you can see that in the difference here between the green and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, and the, the solid bars. And so something is missing. And something's missing in looking at an exam that's only certifying a PISA-like measure. GD is doing a PISA-like measure. And what you can see is when you measure these non-cognitive skills and form them as a bundle, as a set of traits, put them together in a scalar measure, that you find substantial differences. Uh, the GDs and the high school dropouts are very similar to each other in terms of these non-cognitive traits. And there's work in Japan, and some by people at this institute here, 
given at the base of this, showing that if you look at years of schooling attained, or say, especially at earnings with and without Japan, with and without schooling in Japan, that these traits, uh, openness to experience, emotional stability, agreeableness, conscientiousness, all play a role in predicting earnings. And if you look, for example, at the difference between the United States and, uh, and, the, and Japan, you see substantial similarities in the ability, the total amount of uh, outcome that's explained, total amount of variability that's explained in terms of, uh, of uh, earnings explained by these big five inventories and years of schooling. So these things are, these traits are predictive, not just in the US data, but also in Japanese data. So the question that arises is, can these traits be reliably measured? And I'll just say, yes, we can, there are ways to develop more comprehensive measurement systems. And that's what the new OECD report is gonna tell you. It's talking about ways to do it, not just using the psychological inventories, but understanding that these personality traits are relatively enduring patterns of thoughts, we can measure them. All measures of psychological traits end up as measures of performance on some task. And so what we've come to understand is that by looking at various tasks, we can see how character and cognitive skills can be used to measure uh, tasks. I, I'm sorry, performance on tasks can be used to measure both character and cognitive skills. And of course, the measurements on any task have to be adjusted for the incentives to perform well on the task and the effort expended on the task. But it also is very important to understand, and this is what we've come to understand, if you look, for example, at things like grades that many people associate with ability, that much of the variation in grades, this is from a study we did in Holland, a uh, recent study a few years ago, where we decompose what the variability is among children in grades, and we find that essentially, um, much of the variation in grades, it has to do with, uh, stand, with measures of personality. That's the white measures here in these uh, charts. And what we also see is that uh, the structure of, uh, of the uh, uh, IQ is playing a very limited role. In achievement tests, even in PISA, IQ plays a role, but these personality factors also play a role. So what do we know about the gaps? So I'm saying that capabilities matter, there's a large literature that shows they can they predict. The literature in Japan, when it's been applied to the same kind of analyses as applied in the US, confirms the studies in the US and in Western Europe. So a second key point is essentially that the gaps in the cognitive scores, just take a look at cognitive scores, between the highly skilled parents, the most educated mothers, and those that are less educated are very substantial. If you look at the age 18, so into the near college, into the college going years, you see the children of highly educated mothers do much better. These are in terms of standard deviations of tests, much better than the children from the bottom of the distribution. So there's a substantial difference in these traits. And what we can see that's really interesting, I think, in this diagram is that these traits, this gap in the traits that appears here is actually also showing up here. So even at age three, long before children enter school, the gaps are there. And at least in the US, we see that these gaps, well, they change a bit over as they go through schools. In the US, the schools are very unequal, but nonetheless, there's a near parallelism in those traits. So the parallelism is the feature, not the absolute level of the gap. And we get similar gaps when we look at non-cognitive skills. And if we turn to the data for Japan, work that's recently done by Hamano, we can see gaps that are similar, not quite the same and at earlier ages, but we see that the lexical ability of children by annual household income, there are substantial gaps between those uh, who are from more advantaged families and those from disadvantaged families. And there are many different ways to measure this dimension. So for example, Hideo Akibashi has actually shown how the gaps in academic ability in mathematics, in uh, uh, family income, uh, both uh, by measure of family income or parents' uh, uh, education uh, are very substantial. So there is at least a correlation between family income and uh, family background and achievement of children. But the question is, how do you interpret this evidence? And this is the evidence, this has been an eternal question in the whole literature and is very important for economic and social policy. Is it due to genes? 
Is it due primarily to family environments? Are there interventions we can take? Is it neighborhood? Is it community? What's the role of the family? Is it actual parenting decisions? Or is it just some general trait of the parent? Are there actions that parents can take? And what we've come to learn from a large body of studies is that the quality of home environments by family type is highly predictive of adult success. And so a very famous Japanese uh, scholar, a one who actually created, I think, a major uh, uh, institution here in Japan, and who wrote much in, during the period of the Meiji Restoration, made the following statement. And this is a statement where he agreed very closely with what Adam Smith had written uh, about, a, about 100 years before. And that is that individual differences really came down to differences in education, not to differences in genetics. I think that position is a little too extreme. But what it does suggest is that environments can play an important role, education plays an important role, and that I think if anything, if we updated this statement that was made some 150, 140 years ago, that what we can also see is that there actually is a substantial improvement uh, in, in the sense that education should be defined much more broadly. So what do we know about family environments? In the United States, we study these. I already gave you the verbal description of these. We can see substantial differences in children. So children from very disadvantaged families versus advantaged families. The number of words they hear in an hour is almost four to one, three and a half, four to one, between uh, the children of the advantaged and the children of the disadvantaged. And the parenting styles differ. Much more encouragement much more encouragement among the uh, uh, families that are more affluent, much more educated, and much less encouraging. And this leads to huge differences in vocabulary at age three, long before children enter school. And I think that's a very important lesson. And again, if we turn to the data from Japan, we can see at least that there's a strong relationship uh, in the way the mothers are actually intervening with the child. So if we look at the actual uh, notions about how often the mother visits the museum, and we look at the differences of people in terms of the educational status of the mother. More educated mothers are more likely to take their children to museums, to read books to them, to introduce them to culture, to give their children that verbal bath that plays a major role. And I think that's, uh, and, and it's, it's very important. Now, again, the reason why I mention this is that family status plays a huge role. And the family status is changing around the world. The family is under transition everywhere. Here in Japan, to a less degree, actually, than it is in the United States, but it's also very important changes going on in Japan. So in the United States, it's the case now that close to 30% of all children are in families with a single parent. And generally, in the United States, not always, but generally, that's families. those are families where there are fewer resources, there are fewer investments in the child, there are fewer parental resources to available to the child. Uh, and the greatest sectoral growth is in the sector of children where the mother was never married, there's never been a father around, and there actually is a substantial impairment in resources. There's a similar figure, but less striking, for Japan. Here you can see that the level of the problem is much lower. The percentages are obviously about a fifth of the US problem. But there is a growth in this factor, and especially among the single mothers. That group that I mentioned is showing high levels of poverty and high levels of disadvantage. And if we look, for example, at the percentage of single parents' uh, households among households with children under age 20, there is a secular trend. So how do we interpret this? What is it that's going on in the family, and what should we think about it? Well, what I want to talk about now is a study that essentially says, is it family income? Is it a matter of redistribution? Should we simply give resources to families that are rich? We think about poverty as a matter of income, but I think that's a very limited view. Poverty has to be thought of in a much deeper and serious way. And so let me give you an example. Many people, and in fact that I mentioned, I think that the intergenerational elasticity in Denmark is 0.15, very low. That beta that looks at the relationship between father and son it's not zero, but it's very close to zero, whereas in Japan, it's about 0.4. So many people look to Denmark, Norway, and Sweden as kind of ideals, models, where you have a lot of low inequality, you have a very high, a very low uh, IGE, you have a lot of social mobility, and free tuition and everything. So in the United States, we see a pattern, and this pattern is very striking. The pattern is that we see children 
more able children are much more likely to go to college. That's, that's the main finding. Ability quartile one, two, three, and four, more able children go to college. But within the, each of those ability distributions of children, we see that family income does play a role. It's not a, it's, it, I think the biggest difference is ability, but nonetheless you can see a role. And especially for children at the bottom of the ability distribution, families that are relatively affluent are much more likely to send their children to school than those that are less affluent. Now, you look at the study, and in Japan, there's a very strong correlation uh, between family income and uh, uh, whether or not children are going on to directly into employment or on to four-year college. So we can see, as we go across the income distribution, there's a substantial change in, uh, in, that, uh, in that relationship. So if we compare now the US and Denmark, and we ask ourselves, OK, Denmark is this model welfare state. Many people have suggested that the social welfare state of Western Europe should be now introduced more comprehensively into Japan. So will we get rid of this question of social mobility? Well, the question is, how different is Denmark from the US? That's an interesting question. And we looked at that question recently. So I have a paper with a, with a visitor at the University of Chicago, a, a Danish student who's working with me. And what we can see is if we look, for example, at uh, the relationship between mother's education and high school completion, well, they're not exactly the same, but you can see that the mother's a college education. Remember, in Denmark, there's no tuition. There's a low level of inequality. No issue about going to school in terms of tuition. Much lower income inequality. Yet parental education is playing a major role. There's a very strong relationship. So you look at college attendance, very strong role. They're not identical, but they're eerily similar. And what we've come to understand, and if you look, for example, high school completion by mother's education, Denmark and the US, this is just repeating more or less that figure, uh, college attendance. What is the role of capabilities of explaining the gap? Well, we can then compare these same cognitive and non-cognitive abilities in Denmark and the US. And what's interesting is you see a pattern. They're not identical. But if you look at this pattern, this is a sheet that's showing exactly how, as you move from the bottom to the top, the bottom to the top in, in both uh, uh, income and uh, parental income and wealth, that you're seeing a relationship that's very eerily similar between these two, uh, in terms of cognitive skill levels between Denmark. So family disadvantage or advantage is playing a similar role between the two countries, even though there is a lot of, quote, alms to the poor and a massive amount of redistribution. If you go to the, and ask the question, well, how much, uh, uh, how much is important to parental wealth, uh, income profile, you get very high similarity. Now, figure 19 in your graph essentially is showing you, well, what happens if I measure abilities, cognitive and non-cognitive, between Denmark and uh, the United States. The United States is CLSY. And what you can see is a very, very similar pattern. Given abilities, given capabilities at age 18, you're getting a pattern of similarity that I think is eerie and I think is very important. It's suggesting that some aspect of, the, of ability is playing a major role, and that is something that is actually far more important uh, in explaining uh, differences and gaps than we usually give it credit for. And so again, once we condition on the ability, uh, we find that the family well background effects are much weaker. So what do we know? Well, I'll just give you some very brief overviews about why I think that family environments matter. But let me give you something that challenges the genetic view that many people still hold. I know it's viewed by, by probably most of the people in this room aren't naive about believing the importance of genetics or the exclusive importance of genetics. But a recent study that was done was looking at what is called methylation, DNA methylation and histone acetylation patterns. These are monozygotic twins. These are identical twins. And these are twins that are followed, looked at age three and at age five. So what you're getting is a slice of this DNA. And what you're finding is essentially, and the colorations show the differences and lack of differences. Remember, they're born identical. They have exactly the same DNA when they're born. And what you see is even at age three, the differential colors between one twin and the other twin, this twin and that twin, uh, are showing substantial differences already at age three. At age 50, where you've had a full lifetime of experience, there are substantial differences. So even the genes, even when we think about genes, the genes are, exper are, are experientially modified. 
So what do we know about these interventions? I've done some interventions myself or worked with analysts who've done the interventions. I've helped them analyze them looking at monkeys. And we can see when we look at monkeys where we can experimentally manipulate environments, we can actually change the gene expression in ways that are actually uh, uh, showing that, chill, that those monkeys that are exposed to disadvantaged environments, and a disadvantage would be isolated environments, environments without stimulation, without the uh, uh, analog of what a stim human stimulating environment would be, grow up with substantially greater health problems and substantially greater behavior problems that plague them throughout their whole lifetime. So what do we know from a body of interventions? Well, we have a large number of interventions. They provide argument against a purely genetic notion. They provide strong evidence. And they show that parenting, which is a kind of intervention, can be very, very beneficial, especially for disadvantaged children. But what did we learn from the main intervention? The one intervention I've been associated with in the United States is so-called Perry Preschool Program. This was a program that was instituted in a suburb of Detroit uh, some 40, 50, some 50 years ago now, uh, where disadvantaged black children were actually given an intervention where they were taken for a few hours a day at ages three and four, were given stimulation, were given uh, cognitive and social emotional stimulation, and then at age five put back in the same schools as the control group, experimentally chosen, and longitudinal follow-up through age 50. And a very interesting pattern occurred. The very interesting pattern was that there was a huge growth in cognition in terms of IQ, but that faded out. By age 10, there was no difference between the treatment and control. So many people looking only at intelligence and say, oh, this is a failed intervention. We've looked at this, they failed. But yet, this Perry program has a statistically significant annual rate of return, and it's of order of magnitude of 6 to 10% per annum. And that's compared to the stock market in the US before the 2008 meltdown, that's essentially about 7%. So it's in that range. So this is a very profitable investment. What did it work through? It promoted primarily through cognitive and character channels. So these early interventions reduced problems and promoted social behavior. And what was the mechanism? It was changing what, what, what psychologists would call externalizing behavior, the ability to control your aggression, to, to control your emotions. Uh, they showed the treatment group has a distribution, a higher score is a better measure, a better outcome, that the treatment group has more favorable. And if we look at the treatment effects and decompose, and these are all the different treatment effects of this program in terms of uh, uh, employment, in terms of monthly income, tobacco usage, crime, and so forth, that non-cognitive skills play a very substantial role. And the surprising thing, and this is why I think we need to think more broadly about these fragmented solutions that characterize policy making around the world is that we find long-term effects of health. So for example, we find, for example, the treatment and control group, substantial difference between the treatment and control group. We see substantial changes in uh, diet and uh, exercise, smoking behavior and the like. But even more striking is a study that was done on a, a related intervention that was done some 10 years later, the so-called ABC intervention that was somewhat more intensive. And people were followed with medical records, detailed medical records at age 35. And we see substantial improvements in terms of reduction in obesity, reduction in hypertension, and other syndromes. Metabolic syndrome, which is a precursor for diabetes and heart disease, substantially reduced between the control group and the treatment group. So what we see is the treatment group, the group in blue, is substantially improved on a variety of health dimensions that affect life. These are the actual measures in terms of uh, diastolic, systolic blood pressure, substantial differences. So here's this policy. Increasing a number of these basic capabilities that I emphasize allow people to expand the opportunities to be what they want to be, to, incur to allow them to function more broadly in life. And it operates through multiple channels. It's promoting education. It's promoting reduction of crime. It's promoting engagement in the larger society. And you can show that it even promotes voting and promotes a number of other uh, d devices. So, and actually, uh, again, the effects of IQ are relatively moderate. But there are some slight effects of this on IQ. So what's the lesson that we draw from this? Well, what we find then is that the most important component of this kind of uh, intervention is that it isn't changing the nature of the parent-child relationship. 
And if we look at the comparable in intervention and evaluations for successful programs at the workplace and in adolescent years, it's changing the attachment, the engagement. And it really changes the nature of what we mean by parenting and learning. We typically have this very, as I say, a mechanical view about how education works, even how parenting works. But understanding this dynamic system, I think, is very important. And so John Dewey, in a uh, famous, uh, 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 famous educator of, uh, in the, about 100 years ago, wrote that successful schools do what successful parents do. That was the idea, which is what he was saying that schools are doing, really working with the child, scaffolding the child, building the child, and creating that opportunity. And I would argue that recent analyses would change this to say that successful interventions promote capabilities at any age to do what successful parents and mentors do. So it's this broader notion about what education is and what successful educators do. Many of you here are teachers, you've engaged in the classroom, you know that some of the most successful interventions that you do is actually engaging the child or the student one-on-one. -on -one. So basically, by providing information, by changing the preferences of parents or by giving them information, and having the parent respond to the child's curiosity and even changing the nature of the parent-child relationship, you can produce substantial effects. So going back to this Perry program that has such high economic returns, we see substantial changes in parental warmth, reduction in family contract, uh, conflict, and in higher levels of parental authority. I would just point out that, uh, uh, that despite all this information, many countries, Japan included, doesn't spend all that much. So what's the mechanism that I want to summarize with? The notion is, is that skills beget skills, that the dynamics of skill formation really has to be understood, that these social and emotional skills produce cognitive skills, that health produces these cognitive skills. Cognitive skills are producing greater health. And there's a dynamic process to this, so that it's easier to change the skill base of children at earlier ages than it is at later ages. So this diagram, which is too busy and probably comes too late in the lecture, nonetheless goes through and you can see that if we start from the prenatal years through childhood and into adulthood, we come to understand that these early years are highly valuable because of the malleability and the flexibility of the child. In the later years, certain skills are still malleable, but the full base of skills is not. And when we get into adulthood and we get older, we find that those skills, which produce many different outcomes, are actually that base of skills that produce many different outcomes plays a very powerful role in shaping. So understanding how these different stages of childhood matter greatly is really important. And so the notion that economists have used here is the notion of static complementarity, having higher levels of a skill boost the productivity of other skills and investment, and then investing today boosts skills tomorrow. That's the notion of dynamic complementarity, and that increases with age and that there are critical and sensitive periods that shape the way that we invest. But I don't want to say that early life conditions are the full story. There is resilience, recovery, and repair. So it's not that we can't do something at later stages. It's just that we can be much more effective in the early years. Uh, but sometimes these early and later remediation efforts, especially those that are motivated towards cognition and promoting cognition, are frequently costly and ineffective. But there are some adolescent policies that are effective that work primarily through promoting these non-cognitive and social skills. And here I would say it's exactly the same ingredient that was going on in Perry, that's going on in successful families. So what about promoting education? Let me just uh, say that there is a lot of evidence that early life factors play a huge role. So if we look, for example, at what the gains are to education, uh, and we break those out into factors that are due to the causal effect of education and the factors that are present before education begins, we find a very strong effect of early life factors. Early life factors are very important. Education also plays a major role. And schooling can promote both cognitive and non-cognitive ability. So let me summarize in the brief time I have and talk about what I've really tried to say. What I want to say is that the returns to a unit yen invested in a child. Imagine we are social planners, and we try to draw on the body of knowledge that we have acquired in, I'd say, we, this collective sense, the economists, the sociologists, the, the child development experts. And you ask, if you're at the beginning of the life of a child, and it's very important, this diagram is really stated at the beginning. And we ask, where, if you were planning to put your first dollar of investment, 
where would you load most of your investment? Well, what you would find is very high returns to the early years, the prenatal programs, programs targeted towards the earliest years. Why? Because it builds a skill base that makes later programs effective. And if we draw this figure for children at later stages in the life cycle, more able children, those who with greater capabilities, are the ones that also have the greatest benefits. But there, that's because of the early intervention that they've received. So for the disadvantage, I think, the social policy is uh, that we want to, uh, spending in most societies is almost in reverse order. This diagram has to be carefully digested. It's that for the beginning of the life cycle. But it's suggesting uh, and I may go back to the diagram, that, that pre-distribution, not redistribution, prevention, and not just remediation is important. So we need to prioritize, and we need to understand that instead of having a Department of Education or a Department of Health or a Department, we might want to have a Department of Human Capabilities that essentially recognizes these universal capabilities that affect our performance in a variety of different dimensions. And this aspect of mentoring, teaching, socializing the child plays a role that we don't fully understand that we're emerging understanding. And this changes the way we think about an efficient educational policy. So I would say not that we don't want to have redistribution. I know there are plans, discussions in Japan about changing the redistributive nature. Japanese society is less redistributive than other societies. Uh, but I think what we want to think about too is pre-distribution, to understand that it's more than just giving money. It's also a matter of actually giving people skills. And that it's not just a matter of giving families income, it's a matter of giving families the tools to give effective parents, providing the environment to create those capabilities. So thank you very much for your attention.